This was a real revelation that artists are going to be challenged in the coming years by AI image generators, by people that are going to want to claim primacy over original artworks. Hi, I'm Tim Schneider, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News, where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. In the borderlands between art and technology, no single development has sucked up more oxygen this year than the rise of image generators powered by artificial intelligence. Not so long ago, projects like these were a fringe experiment whose results were usually more intriguing for what they got wrong than for what they got right. But in 2022, AI-driven image generators have made a quantum leap in quality, speed, and affordability. It's not an exaggeration to say that, thanks to these tools, never in the history of civilization has it been easier, faster, or cheaper to produce professional-looking visuals of anything a person could dream up, even if they have no artistic training whatsoever. This is both extremely cool and extremely concerning, especially if you happen to be a human who makes a living as a commercial illustrator. This October, a strange saga that played out on the live streaming platform Twitch showed how the tension between flesh and blood image makers and AI is getting stronger and weirder every day, with serious consequences for age-old debates about plagiarism, ownership, and the value of making art in the first place. Thankfully, the knowledgeable and intrepid Zachary Small is here today to walk us through the initial scandal and the murky future of commercial art in the age of AI. My advice, buckle up because this is going to get a little surreal. Zachary Small, welcome back to The Art Angle. Hey, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So this is kind of a wild story, even for people like you and me who are pretty deep into the whole crossover between art and tech. But for the sake of our listeners who might not be as deep in the weeds, I want to start with first principles. So pretend that I'm a six-year-old. How would you explain to me what an AI-powered image generator does? (laughs) Okay, so you are a six-year-old. And let's say the image generator is also in your art class, right? So The same way that you might learn to draw from a teacher, the machine is learning from the internet. The internet is the machine's teacher. It just so happens, though, that the machine is much, much smarter than you, has billions of teachers, and is capable of listening to them all at the same time. So, you know, we're really dealing with a program that is able to bring in massive amounts of input and create massive amounts of output at a speed that is simply outpacing human imagination in many ways. How it does this exactly is a little bit different, I guess, than the art school idea. Unfortunately, the AI does not have hands, but it does have usually these massive training sets of data. So one of the most popular ones is called Leon 5B, which is about like 5.8 billion, billion with a B, image text pairs. So what the AI image generator does, and you know this varies from company to company, algorithm to algorithm, but they go through all of this information, and this information has been scraped, they call it scraping, from the internet often, taking images just off of you know, servers, and it creates a system for itself through machine learning to train on those images, and usually also has another algorithm that judges the quote unquote, artworks that the generator is creating. And based on certain criteria, it can sort of rule out certain images versus others. You know, if someone gives a text prompt asking for a clown wearing Uggs and it gives you a clown wearing Crocs, that one's out of the pile. That doesn't count. That's bad. And unlike your six-year-old self, the AI image generator isn't going to cry. It's not going to get angry saying, you know, I want my clown and Crocs. It's going to do the job and learn from that and and move on. There's a a weird tension there, I, I think, in a lot of these models between creativity 
what we expect from creativity and the amount of freedom that an AI image generator actually has to produce content. Right. So taking off my imaginary six-year-old costume now, which is sort of a terrifying image in itself, but let's set that aside. So we're talking about clowns, six-year-old costume. <laughs> it's really a Halloween episode. Appropriately so. So essentially what we're talking about here is a set of algorithms that are super powerful, that are trained, to use the parlance of AI, on billions and billions of images that are labeled in one way or another so that the algorithm is learning what any possible thing in the world is supposed to look like. And just over extreme repetition, it ends up learning what makes up a clown, what makes up a dog, whatever. And over time, obviously I'm simplifying this a lot, but over time it gets to a point where it understands well enough how to create all of these different images so that when someone prompts it to create like a combination of images in a certain style, it like understands all the component parts and can assemble them into a super specific hole and just spit it out in like a matter of seconds. Is that more or less right? Yeah, I think that's the rough idea of it. I would just add there too, of, of course, human input is so key to creating what they would call adversarial networks, these machine learning systems. And as we've seen, you know, the reason why we're probably in this big watershed moment for AI is because it's so popular to use. You see it on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, people are posting their own experiments. Well, when tens of thousands of people are experimenting with these machines, the machines are getting exponentially better at creating the images. Right. And that's actually dovetails with something that I wrote very recently, which was sort of about how the thing that some people who are using these AI image generators don't think about is that it's taking something from the user even as it's giving the user back whatever the user wants. So as you're prompting it for whatever, a clown wearing Uggs, a uh, corgi on the moon, I don't know, your attempts to refine it and get better results and say, oh, no, 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 that's not quite right, do it this way, it's all teaching these algorithms to get better at what they do, sort of prompt by prompt, day by day, at like a massive scale. Exactly. And I think there's always a market side of this conversation. And as much as like this has been such a public fascination, there's tons of articles being written on this. Both you and I have written articles on this topic. There's a lot of money behind it as well. And this is sort of becoming, I don't know if it's the hot new thing, AI and these attempts at making image generators have been around for years, but it's definitely a hot thing for sure. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that side of it too, because as you're saying, these are algorithms that have been in development for years and years and years, but all of a sudden it just seems like since about spring, maybe early summer at the latest, just seems to be everywhere. Like every time I open Twitter, there's somebody posting some wild image that they generated with Dolly or one of these other platforms. And you have news stories talking about it and all this stuff. So just like from your standpoint, like what happened that all of a sudden took these things from just being in development to suddenly being just ubiquitous, it mm -hmm. seems? I think there's a couple components here. First is, like I said, the market component. So a lot of companies have been developing AI image generators for a while. One of the most popular ones out there that people might know now is called Dolly. That's by OpenAI, which is a company that was founded by Elon Musk. There are certainly a lot of startups around AI image generation or independent companies like MidJourney is another popular one. There's also stable diffusion, I think, is another one that's pretty up there. But the money is just pouring in. So there was a recent story in the New York Times that said that it's a company called Jasper. It's a year-old company. It's an AI copywriting app for marketers. So I believe not only can it do some image making, but it can also like literally write copy. 
Usually you have a person doing that, but they raised $125 million with a $1.5 billion valuation. So that's some serious capital floating around Silicon Valley right now. The other side, I think, is cultural for sure. This has been in the public imagination for decades, this idea of artificial intelligence. Of course, you can watch 2001 A Space Odyssey and, and see a, a very negative view of what that could be, but it, you know, People have wondered and dreamed and tried to make this for so many years. And when Stable Diffusion first came out, for instance, 200,000 people downloaded the code since its release in August of this year. That's a lot for something that basically, unless you were in the comp side community, you might have not really known about. Yeah, for sure. And just as another data point for listeners, when... OpenAI made Dolly publicly accessible the end of September. They claimed at the time that they had one and a half million users who were generating two million images using Dolly every day, which is just a massive amount of output for these things. Right. And we haven't even seen the heavy hitters yet. Both Meta, formerly known as Facebook, and Google have their own AI image generators that haven't been released publicly yet. And everyone's yeah. kind of waiting for that foot to fall. And there have been some sort of presentations internally, and I think one publicly for Meta. It's expected that those are just going to blow everything out of the water. Right. And there are also rumors out there, too, that I'm sure you've heard that Apple is working on this very secretly, and Amazon is working on it very secretly. And Maybe not yeah, so, so secretly just... if we know about it. Yeah, good point. Good point. But we are reporters. So. Yeah, well, they, they want that information <laughs> out there. It's part of the competition and a clear drive towards creating more investment in the AI area. You know, as Silicon Valley is trying to move a little bit forward from crypto and all the regulatory issues that Web3 is having right now. Right. And anytime there's a big moment around any technology, all of these major players just if they weren't already rushing toward it, they tend to just because they have, as the old saying goes, more money than God and can just pump it into whichever aspect they want in an attempt to try to just get there before the next guy does. Right. And if I were an economist, which I am not, I would certainly be interested to see how the boom and bust cycle of NFTs is now going to affect investment in AI. Is the speculative frenzy going to suddenly come back and be ignited or are people still sort of open eyes and, and maybe hurting a little bit, looking at AI and saying, mm, maybe we should like be a little bit more conservative this time around. But that remains to be seen. Yeah, I hope that we at The Art Angle can someday find a reporter in New York who maybe has written a book about NFTs and crypto recently, who's like a friend of the show who we could talk to about that at some point. So I don't know, Zachary, if you know anybody who's like that. That will be me in spring 2024. So mark your calendars. The book is coming. It haunts me every single night. And soon it will haunt all of you. Well, haunting just rounds out our whole Halloween episode aesthetic. So there, there you, you go. go. <laughs> okay. So I think that that probably lays out enough of the general landscape so that we can get into the actual meat of the story that you just wrote for us on Artnet News. So... The story starts with a painter making some fan art of an existing anime character, which seems like a pretty innocent setup, and yet through the intervention of AI image generation ends up becoming a big and messy and weird enough scandal that your ears perked up and you were like, okay, this is a story. So what the hell happened, Zachary? So I think for our listeners coming in from more of like, you know, a fine art background, they might not be so accustomed to the wonderful world of video game fan art, but it exists. It is mighty. There aren't so many estimates of how large this community is, but it's easily in the tens of millions when you look at activity on a live streaming platform called Twitch, where a lot of these fan artists will go on and, and will be live sketching their digital drawings for just hundreds of sometimes thousands of people that just like to watch them. This particular 
artist was sketching a character called Raiden Shogun from a Chinese video game called Genshin Impact. Genshin Impact has 60 million monthly active players, and the game's generated like $3.7 billion in just the last two years. So I know we talk about like big value art money stuff in the auction world, for instance, the video game stuff is blowing it out of the water in terms of money and audience. So a lot of people were watching this happen. It was about like an 11 hour video, but halfway through the artist drawing this image of this character, one of the viewers basically, I mean, we can probably assume it was through a screenshot, took the image they were creating. The details weren't there, but the figure was mostly complete and they put it through an AI image generator called Novel AI, which is sort of sold as like an artificial intelligence assistance program. You could use it to help finish a book or in this case, finish an illustration. So this sort of rogue viewer took the illustration halfway through the live stream and completed it and then posted it on social media. We can't really speculate so much of the motivation of this person and why they did this. I mean, it's a little bit strange. But they did have the gall to then go on six hours later when the live streamer finally finished her artwork and posted it on social media to, you know, basically accuse the original artist of stealing the work. And even to say this, and this was a struggle when writing the article, is like, this just sounds confusing. How can someone steal an artwork that hasn't been finished yet? And yet that is the power of AI image generation in this case. You can take a work before it's finished, complete it in a matter of seconds, post it online and pretend like you are the original author. Okay. So just to recap before we move on, I just want to make sure I've got this straight. So essentially what you're telling me is that there was some unscrupulous viewer of a living human painter's live screen and this unscrupulous viewer screen captured the painter's work in progress, fed the screen cap into an AI assistance program to fill in the blanks of what the painter had already done, basically. Came out with a finished image and then had the nerve to go on Twitter and try to use the AI completed artwork as evidence that the painter had stolen the work of a computer without crediting the computer? Yes, that very strange story is correct. That appears what has happened. Again, like these are very popular artists in the fan art community. So a lot of people were watching this and were outraged by the accusations because they had seen this artist making it live. So it didn't really go that far. The rogue viewer, some people call them a thief. I don't know if I would go that far, but they ended up deleting their Twitter account and taking it down. But I think for a lot of people, you know, this was a real revelation that artists are going to be challenged in the coming years by AI image generators, by people that are going to want to claim primacy over original artworks. You know, we're going to get into a new period of forgeries where it's not just like, oh, did you copy a contemporary artist's style and you're claiming it's really theirs, whatever. We're going into a very difficult, technologically powered era. Right. And it seems like this is just another realm of a theme that tends to play out over and over again, where you have technology moving forward at an extreme clip powered by money and interest and the rest of the world just has to figure out a way to try to catch up to it but the technology may be moving faster than the humans who are trying to figure out what to do about what the technology is doing yeah that's totally right and i think in terms of trying to catch up to this technology at least within the art world there doesn't seem to be much of an attempt to catch up happening While doing this, I searched some of these databases that have all these images that the machine learning is using. And I was just kind of curious. I was like, which of the like most expensive, most famous living artists are in this data set? And if you were to search someone like Jeff Koons or Damien Hirst or even someone like Cindy Sherman, you're going to get thousands upon thousands of images of their artwork. 
There is a legal question here, which I think we'll get to later. But first, the question becomes like, how ethical is this to train a computer off of these existing artworks by artists that make their living based on those artworks? And galleries are usually in the mode of protecting their artists' reputations, really being on the lookout for these kinds of things where their artists can be used without their consent. All of the galleries that I reached out to, including Gagosian and Pace Gallery, had no comment for me. Got it. So you did a kind of internal review to just see which prominent artist's work you could find in at least one of these big image databases. And obviously you came back with some big names that were in there. Just stepping back a second, are there any kind of internal checks and balances on what these algorithms can be trained on or what they can produce? Or is it basically just a complete free-for-all? Listen, I mean, these are algorithms that are written by humans. It's easy to forget that sometimes when we talk about AI being quote unquote alive, the algorithm is going to do whatever the human programs it to do. And that includes putting in restrictions for what kind of people can be used by the machine learning system, objects, whatever you want. And it does appear, although the guidelines and restrictions are still a little bit vague, it does appear that a lot of these generators, such as like Dolly or Stable Diffusion, do have blocks in place for certain celebrities and politicians. It's reined in to some extent on certain public figures or maybe public figures, broadly speaking, but paintings, sculptures, fan art, anime video game imagery, that stuff isn't necessarily being treated the same way. No, according to a lot of legal experts, a lot of those images which are publicly available online would fall under fair use doctrine. There are some exceptions, like you could get into European Union law and like these quote unquote rights to be forgotten. So if individuals wanted to ask these AI companies to be taken out of the learning data sets, the companies would most often comply with that sort of request from an EU citizen. Otherwise, it is kind of up to them. And I, I think a lot of people have this question of class and power then. If wealthy and powerful people can be automatically opted out from these learning sets and from their images being used, distorted, and misused by computers, why can't the average Joe be able to do that? Well, let's stay on the legal side of things just for a second, because I want to go a little deeper into this idea of fair use versus copyright. So I'm going to assume that there are some listeners out there who've been following along with our conversation and had a kind of cognitive dissonance moment where they were like, wait, artists that are producing work, like that's intellectual property that they own that they should have some kind of copyright protections over. So why is it fair use that these images are just being scraped into these massive databases and basically turning into reference points for, in a lot of cases, massive corporations or very well-funded algorithms to just be able to put out whatever they want? Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about the legal minutia of this? <laughs> I will spare you some of the minutia, and part of the reason why I will spare you it is because copyright is in a state right now. The Supreme Court recently heard a case involving a Warhol photograph, which is basically why a lot of copyright lawyers are like sort of on pause, waiting to see what the Supreme Court will say about fair use, about appropriation in the art world. And this is going to have massive consequences for all of copyright law. And I imagine it might also impact artificial intelligence and their use of artworks. As it stands right now, there's not a lot of precedent when it comes to copyright and artificial intelligence. This is still a relatively new technology. Courts move slowly. And also, as we've discussed, not a lot of artists are even aware that their work is in these training data sets. So on one hand, the legal work has not yet really been done to clearly establish sort of what is and is not 
legal here. The other side, though, when looking at existing copyright law is that it is really stringent about what is kosher or not. So there's a rule here, which is substantial similarity, which means that two works have to be substantially similar. It can't just be like, oh, I put into the AI generator prompt Matisse making a Pikachu or Monet making a Pikachu, which someone actually did. And it is very cute. But that wouldn't be substantially similar because although it might look like a Monet painting, Monet never, to my knowledge, painted a Pikachu. That's why I've never really liked Monet. Yeah, I've never liked Monet because he doesn't do Pikachu. I'm more of a Bulbasaur person, which would really fit with the lily pads, but that's another podcast. What we understand here, though, is that nobody is going to be looking at that Monet Pikachu painting and mistake it for a genuine Monet And if the creator of this work is not trying to pass it as a genuine Monet, what's the copyright issue exactly? What is the damage done? And I think we've seen this just, you know, anecdotally, people that are using this AI imaging software in most cases are happy to announce that it was created by AI. That's part of the cool factor right now. So it's just really unclear how this will be settled But it seems to the legal experts that I've talked to right now that it would be pretty hard to prove that something generated with AI actually goes against the letter of the law as it stands today. I want to step away from the conceptual swamp that I accidentally stuck us into there with copyright law and IP and all that kind of stuff. Let's just go back to something very grounded, which is that you talked about how you went into one or more of these databases and actually were able to search to find these particular artists' works. Is that something that anybody can just log into one of these databases and do? Is there a separate tool? Like, what are the parameters of even finding out if you're an artist, whether or not your work is being used in one of these things? Anyone can do it. And for all of its faults, that's one thing I will say about this sort of current generation of... AI software, crypto developers, a lot of this data is public. So I mentioned Leon 5B, which is the very big archive of image and text. That's publicly available. You could download it right now, although it might break your computer with the size of that file. But some people have also created their own little like search tool functions to do this. So the artists Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon created a tool called Spawning. And they have a search function called Have I Been Tracked? And so you can go on that. It's linked in my article as well. And you can search whatever. You can search both with text and image. I had some fun on this. I guess I should have put your face into it, Tim, and seen it. If AI has been training off of your visage. I did put in Larry Gagosian himself. He shows up. Put in Jerry Saltz. He shows up. There's a, a frowning image of him somewhere in there. So it's not just the artists or the artwork. It's billions and billions of photographs. Anyone could kind of be in it as long as you search and check it out. First off, that's wild. And I'm pretty confident I'm not going to be in any of these databases. Oh, we can check right now. (laughs) Maybe I'll do that while you're asking me more questions. (laughs) So we're talking about, with the exception of me, We're talking about pretty prominent public figures or canonical artists like Monet or Picasso or whoever else. And this kind of goes deeper than that realm of fame, right? I mean, there is a sidebar in your piece that I thought was super fascinating in itself, which is about a living artist that I will admit I did not know going to guess a lot of our listeners didn't know, but it's a guy named Greg Rutkowski. Who is Greg Rutkowski and how does he fit into this whole picture? We're going to fit him into the picture for a moment, but I do have to break away to say here that, Tim, you are part of the learning data set. (laughs) Your profile picture on Artnet is within the mainframe. You are part of the matrix now. Congratulations. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow, this is this is a big moment. Yeah, if you if you need a moment to uh, sit out and process that, we can take it. 
Um, so, yeah, so you mentioned an artist, Greg Rakowski, and so he is someone who sort of rose the alarm here and is largely being credited as like one of the biggest figures right now among artists who are saying, hey, we got to change how this is going. This is not quite correct. Apparently, he's like one of the most popular artists to search. So he's someone that creates high fantasy images. I believe that he also creates scenes for like video games as well. So within these cyber communities, he's a well-known illustrator, although he might not be as well-known in the fine art world. But his name's been prompted in these AI image generators tens of thousands of times. He's like, I believe, more popular than Michelangelo in the search bar. And so what's happened is a lot of people keep tagging him in these works that the AI generators have made being like, wow, this is a great image by you. Congratulations. And he's like, I never made this. So even though to connect it back to what we were talking about with copyright, sure, maybe this doesn't violate the law, but it seems to have crossed an ethical boundary where suddenly an artist whose livelihood is making these illustrations is sort of like, losing out, at least in popularity for now, to the machine. And he's the most prompted artist. The machine is a Greg expert. That's a big worry for a lot of these illustrators. What if the machine becomes a better expert in their styles than them? So I believe that when you talk to Matt Dryhurst of Spawning, he told you that, at least when it comes to like commercial art, that he believes that the work that human working artists have been doing for all this time will be fully automated in the next couple of years. Is that accurate, first off? And if so, what's your personal take on that? I mean, there's no accuracy in future telling. (laughs) His guess is as best as ours, but certainly as someone that's working and interested in the AI field, you know, he understands what's going on. That is the growing consensus that this is going to be used in marketing as quickly as possible, as quickly as they can get away with it. Although there's certainly backlash. I think as well, the next grain of salt I would put into the story here is that what we're seeing happen with the metaverse and NFTs and this other sort of side of the computer art nexus is a real return to materiality. People do want to live in the real world, it turns out. And part of that is having humans create their art. So whether or not this completely eclipses is one question. I think the other question is if it's going to damage the livelihood of commercial artists and illustrators. And according to the sources that I've spoken to, they feel like it's already kind of starting to happen. And it's part of a larger trend that's been happening over the last few years. So I spoke to Liz DeFiori, who's the head of the Graphic Artist Guild, and their guild collects a lot of data on this issue. And what she said was, listen, the sort of average wages of illustrators has been going down for years. And this is a moment, it's more than just a wage threat. It's an existential threat for a lot of these artists who feel like they can't compete with the computer. Who's going to pay them when they can just use a software for pennies on the dollar? Well, this sounds kind of bleak, frankly. If I'm just running back through what we've talked about so far, it sounds like the image databases themselves won't protect artists. The image generators that are pulling from the image databases probably aren't going to protect artists. The court system probably isn't going to protect artists. So are artists able to do anything? Like, are there any actions that are being taken to try to push back against this, even on just sort of like an organizational level? It's really early days still. I think a lot of artists, again, aren't even aware that their work is being used in these systems. I think what Matt Dryhurst and his partner Holly Herndon are doing with spawning is certainly, you know, a step forward. So part of that image search tool is to give artists a way to approach these AI companies and say, hey, I want you to take me out of the data, please. Can you do that? I think as well, the Graphic Artists Guild is doing a lot of data collecting and to a certain degree lobbying these companies to say, hey, you know, and Liz really stressed this in our conversation, I should say. She's not against AI as much as it is a threat. She also sees it as a potential 
good tool for these artists. You could use AI to change the angle that you're looking at the composition, to resize images, to modify and update things, basically taking a lot of the drudgery out of the work that an illustrator doesn't want to do, right? They want to create the image. They want to create art. And that could be a really positive aspect. It, it just depends on sort of where the financial incentives are for these companies and how much artists are given a seat at a, the table to decide upon what comes next. Well, that sounds like at least one possible silver lining to all of this, which also seems like kind of a good note to send people out on. So, Zachary, thank you so much for coming in and illuminating this very weird version of the art world that we're getting deeper into every day. Of course. I love the strange topics. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Caroline Goldstein, and yours truly. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. 